I want to bring to you the next speaker who is a young African woman. And she refers to her children as African. She has five young African children between the age of two and nine. Her name is Swatara Olushoa. I hope I didn't mess that up. <laughs> and she come, she was born and raised in a large, loving family in Detroit, Michigan. She has been active her entire life in the African liberation movement, being reared in the shrine of the Black Madonna Pan American Orthodox Christian Church, along with close family ties with the Nation of Islam. She studied at Morgan University in Baltimore, Maryland, before moving to Houston. She is a vocalist with a diverse portfolio spanning different genres, including gospel, hip hop, rhythm and blues, soul, funk, and opera. She hosted a popular independent internet radio show entitled The Rise and Grind Morning Show on All Real, on All Real Radio. The brainchild of NBUF's own beloved ancestor, Brother Zen. I bring to you Swatara Alashoa. Thank you. May I have permission from my elders to continue? Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Ashe. I bring you greetings from the Houston chapter of the National Black United Front. Uh, <laughs> where our local and national chairman is Kofi Taharka. Our local secretary is Falade Matsi Moyo. Mm. and they send peace, love, light, and blessings as well. This is heavy work that we take on. To have your ancestors use you, for you to be sitting in this room and find this topic important, that's heavy work. Mm. Important work. I didn't even realize until I was asked to come here that I was a part of the reparations movement. Mm. I didn't even realize. And I sat back and I said, well, maybe this is a reparations issue. Now that I think about it, I'm just a 33-year-old mother of five and wife for 10 years trying to teach white people the difference between right and wrong. Because when it come to us and our people, they seem to get amnesia. At any rate, uh, I've been doing a lot of work regarding the Sugar Land 95 in Houston, right outside of Houston. It's a suburb, big fluffy suburb of Sugar Land, Texas. Mm -hmm. A school district decided to build a $50 million career technical center. They were warned by a local historian, Reginald Moore, that there were likely graves there because that land that they purchased was formerly a prison plantation. Right post-Civil War, and that they shouldn't build there. They ignored him, so he lobbied the Texas Historical Commission to contact them on his behalf, which they did, and again, warned the school district that remains were likely there, and they might want to properly survey the land before they break ground, but they said, mm, this is a $50 million deal. No, we building our school. We're not surveying nothing. We'll hire an archaeological firm and just have them on site just in case we find something. So that's what they did. Four months into building, they found the first bone fragments of our ancestors. Two more months of searching, and they found 95 graves that we know of, of our ancestors. They found chains and items indicative of convict labor from the ages as young as 10, when they died, up to 70. More than half of them were under the age of 34. Most of them were around the age of 19, when they died. Worked to death, infections, gunshot wounds, diseases, uh, degenerative muscle disease, cancer, you name it. So what I wanna do is take a moment to properly paint a picture of these men, boys, elders, what they endured, why we are old, mm. 
as a people, how it connects to reparations, the history of Sugar Land, and hopefully I have enough time because it's a lot of information to try to pack into 20 minutes. Yeah. Um, if you are comfortable with doing so, I would like you to close your eyes momentarily. And if you're not comfortable with doing so, that's fine as well. But I really want you to envision triple degree heat, being wrongfully imprisoned, because you ain't a slave no more. Mm. And sugar cane fields taller than you. Imagine being in such a traumatic and deafening situation and you still find the energy to sing. Mm. To sing a song to get you through the day. That is the strength and tenacity and perseverance of our people mm -hmm. who had just endured chattel slavery. Mm -hmm. I'm not even into my presentation yet. All right. Who will pay reparations on my soul? Mm. Many suggestions and documents written, many directions for the end that was given. They gave us pieces of silver and pieces of gold. Tell me, who will pay reparations on my soul? Many fine speeches from the White House desk written on cue cards that were never really there. Yes, but the heat and the summer were there, and the freezing winter's cold. Now tell me, who will pay reparations on my soul? Call my brother a junkie, cause he ain't got no job. Told my old man to leave me when times got hard. Told my mother she got to carry me all by herself. And now that I wanna be a woman who can depend on no one else, what about the red man who met you at the coast? You never dig Sharon, always had to have the most. Mm. And what about Mississippi, the boundary of old? Tell me, who will pay reparations on my soul? Mm. Call my brother a junkie, cause he ain't got no job. Told my old man to leave me when times got hard. Told my mother she got to carry me all by herself. And now that I wanna be a woman who can depend on no one else, mm. What about the red man who met you at the coast? You never dig Sharon, always had to have the most. And what about Mississippi, the boundary of old? Tell me who will pay reparations on my soul. Many fine speeches from the White House desk, written on cue cards that were never really there. Yes, but the heat and the summer were there, and the freezing winter's cold. Tell me who will pay reparations on my soul, who'll pay reparations? Cause I don't dig segregation, but I can't get integration. Mm -hmm. I got to take it to the United Nations. Mm -hmm. Someone to help me away from this nation. Tell me who'll pay reparations on my soul. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Blood money. Slavery by another name, convict leasing. Convict leasing was a system of penal labor practiced in the southern United States and overwhelmingly targeting who? Us, our people, black people, black men, young black men, old black men. What they looked to do was to lock up generations. So they want the granddaddy, they want the daddy, and the son, and the grandson if you're here. They want them all. Convict leasing provided prisoner labor to private parties, such as plantation owners and corporations. Mm -hmm. 
There are multi-billion dollar corporations in existence today with the blood of our ancestors at their foundation. And they balling right now. That's our money. Hmm. The state of Louisiana leased out convicts as early as 1844, but the system expanded all through the South with the emancipation of slaves, emancipation of slaves, at the end of the American Civil War in 1865. It could be lucrative for the states. In 1898, 73% of Alabama's entire annual state revenue came from convict leasing. While northern states, like Illinois, sometimes contracted for prison labor, the historian Alex Lichtenstein notes that only in the South did the state entirely give up its control to the contractor. Hmm. And only in the South did the physical penitentiary become virtually synonymous with the various private enterprises in which convicts labored. Hmm. So in Illinois, you might not have known this, maybe you did, you're gonna find out today. In December, 1868, just 150 short years ago, 1,160 inmates were housed at the Illinois State Prison at Joliet. I hope I'm saying that right. Joliet, you know where that is? That's the place, okay. They had the largest, at the time, in 1868, the largest prison population in the nation. Mm. Those prisoners were forced to make shoes, mm. boots, right. cigars, whatever they could make inside, because we in the north, it wasn't a whole lot of crops. But harnesses for guns, they were forced to make that in those prisons right here, in that prison right here. There we go. Convict lease in the United States was widespread in the South during the Reconstruction period, mm -hmm. after the end of the Civil War, when many Southern legislatures were ruled by majority coalitions of blacks and radical Republicans, and Union generals acted as military governors. Mm -hmm. Farmers and businessmen needed to find replacements for the labor force once their slaves had been freed. Some Southern legislatures passed black codes synonymous with slave codes, to restrict free movement of blacks and force them into employment with whites. For instance, several states made it illegal for a black man to change jobs without the approval of his employer. Mm. Mm. You can't even quit. Mm. <laughs> and go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Oh, I got a better offer over here. No, you didn't. Not if I didn't say you did. That's right. For instance, several states um, convicted, if convicted of vagrancy, blacks could be imprisoned, and they also received sentences for a variety of petty offenses. States began to lease convict labor to plantations and other facilities seeking labor, as the freedmen were trying to withdraw and work for themselves. This provided the states with a new source of revenue during the years when they were financially strapped and lessees profited by the use of forced labor at below market rates. Corruption, lack of accountability, and racial violence resulted in one of the harshest and most exploitative labor systems known in American history. African Americans, mostly adult males, due to vigorous and selective enforcement of laws and discriminatory sentencing, made up the vast majority of the convicts lease. Our people leased and worked to death. And we're talking about children and elders, our children, our elders. Imagine them coming in here right now and putting everybody to work. The writer Douglas A. Blackman described the system. It was a form of bondage distinctly different from that of the antebellum South in that for most men and the relatively few women drawn in, this slavery did not last a lifetime. And it did not automatically extend, extend from one generation to the next. It didn't last a lifetime because your lifetime was greatly decreased. It didn't extend from one generation to the next because the whole generation was there at the same time. Hmm. 
but it was nonetheless slavery, a system in which armies of free men guilty of no crimes and entitled by law to freedom were compelled to labor without compensation, were repeatedly bought and sold, and were forced to do the bidding of white masters through the regular application of extraordinary physical coercion. Essentially, the criminal justice system colluded with private planters and other business owners to entrap, convict, and lease blacks as prison laborers. The constitutional basis for convict leasing is that the 1865 13th Amendment, while abolishing slavery and involuntary servitude generally, permits it as a punishment for a crime. Most of the time, we don't see the faces of the white people behind it, or know exactly what they did, who they did it to, when they did it. So this is Stephen F. Austin, and it's a whole lot of stuff named after him in Texas. <laughs> Stephen F. Austin acquired Fort Bend County through a Mexican land grant. He and the settlers massacred the native people to control the fertile floodplain of the Brazos River. The Brazos River is right next to the land that the Sugar Land 95 were found in, right now today. That's the land that the school district bought. Despite its sweet name, the Sugar Land 95 has a tortured past. Until the Civil War, those families, Austin's family, the families that he provided slaves to, he brought slaves to his, slavery to his communities in Texas. Mm -hmm. Enslaving more people brought more wealth. So until the Civil War, those families used sugar plantations to continue growing that wealth. But following emancipation, the Sugar Bowl of Texas went bankrupt. Mm -hmm. oh my God. Those are children on that plot of land that the school district purchased. These are children that were quote unquote orphaned by their parents who had been incarcerated. And so they incarcerated the children as well. In 1838, three brothers, Matthew, Samuel, and Nathaniel Williams, started one of the first major sugar plantations in Texas on property in what is now known as Sugarland, that had been granted to their family by Stephen F. Austin himself. By the 1850s, sugar was a major industry in Fort Bend, Matagorda, Warden, and Brazoria counties, which became known as the Sugar Bowl of Texas. Like cotton plantations, Sugar plantations relied heavily on slave labor. Harvesting cane was even more arduous than picking cotton. Slaves worked around the clock during harvest season to cut the sugar cane, press out the cane juice, boil it down, and then pack the finished product on the trains to be shipped around the country. Sugar work was about as bad as you can imagine, said Sean Kelly, who was a historian of early American history at the University of Essex. People got sick, they died, women's fertility rates plummeted. Europeans quickly discovered that you couldn't get people to work in sugar voluntarily, which is why there's a strong historical linkage between sugar and slavery. Mm -hmm. Then came the Civil War. The South's defeat of the abolition of slavery plunged the Texas economy into a depression. Deprived of their labor force, most sugar plantations on the lower Brazos went bankrupt. One of the few that survived as the, was the Williams Plantation, which was purchased after the war by Edward H. Cunningham and Little Barry A. Ellis, who were both Confederate veterans. This is a shot of a victim of the Texas convict lease system who was unloading a cane car at the Imperial Sugar Mill in 1900 that Cunningham and Ellis now own. They survived the abolition of slavery by finding a new source of cheap labor, the Texas prison system. Although they weren't the first growers to use convict labor, they were the biggest. In 1878, they signed a contract with the state to lease Texas's entire prison population. They leased Texas's entire prison population, the state of Texas, 
This was perfectly legal since the 13th Amendment, which outlawed slavery, made one very consequential exception. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. So if I can make you a slave because you commit a crime, then I'm about to make everything you do illegal. In the years before the Civil War, Texas state prisons had held around 200 inmates, all kept in a single facility. After abolition, the prison population exploded, and this was in Huntsville, disproportionately, of course, just like today, with our black men mm -hmm. and women. The prison population increased from 489 in 1870 to 1,738 by 1878, and it reached 3,199 by 1890, and 4,109 by 1900, most of them being our people. The working conditions in Cunningham and Ellis' sugar fields were as bad or worse than they had been on the slave plantations. Mm. Mosquito-borne epidemics, frequent beatings, and lack of medical care resulted in a 3% annual mortality rate, and that's what's reported, so we know it was more than that. Right. The plantation soon became notorious across the state as the hell hole on the Brazos. Between 1906 and 1908, the plantation and the sugar processing operations were brought up by Isaac H. Kempner of Galveston and William T. Eldridge of Eagle Lake who formally incorporated as the Imperial Sugar Company. Imperial Sugar Company is a multi-billion dollar corporation today. Right. Four minutes. Yeah. <laughs> multi-billion dollar corporation today, meaning today the Imperial Sugar Company is owned by the Louis Dreyfus Group, mm -hmm. as in the actress Julia Louis Dreyfus, mm -hmm. the white girl from Seinfeld. Yeah, uh -huh. living her best life. Uh huh. They own Imperial Sugar. They are the second largest traders of sugar in the world. They are the largest traders of rice and, guess what, cotton in the world. Lewis Dreyfus Group. That's our money because the Sugar Land 95 and the men that worked and toiled and died on that land with them were the foundation of that corporation. They would not be here making that amount of money today without the slave labor and prison labor of our people. Exactly. Two minutes. And that's when I realized this is a reparations issue. It is. So these are just some shots from Sugar Land. These are the size houses. These are the mansions. They name stuff after mm -hmm. Kempner. They name, they have a, a statue of Stephen F. Austin on a horse with a gun right in front of City Hall. Mm. In their museum, in the foundation of Sugar Land, they don't mention any of the things I just told you. They don't talk about convict leasing. They don't talk about slavery. And companies still profiting off of convict labor right now. Because, yeah. Probably many that you frequent. If you want to take a picture of that. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, you so, Fort Bend much. ISD, Fort Bend ISD, Fort Bend Independent School District. We have to put pressure on them. We are still in that fight. They are still literally right now mishandling the remains of our ancestors of Sugar Land 95. We have been fighting them for two years on every front except legal. We are in the search of a lawyer, a legal team, somebody that's willing to commit some time and due diligence to this issue. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. So there are two commodities that we learned that we're not reaping the benefits of. That's cotton and sugar. Everything. And yet there are some of us that feel like we don't deserve reparations. Yeah. Again, I'll say it again. I'll take your share. Let's give her another hand clap. Thank you. Yeah. 